Well, as you can see behind me, all the aft fuselage and tail section of the airplane build, that's all complete and all put away nicely. And after a little bit longer of a break than I would have liked from building, it's at last time to start moving on to the wings. The kit arrived a few months ago. I've inventoried it. I just pulled out the wing kit. This thing is huge. And now we can get building. Here we go. This first part of the wing construction is focused on the wing spar. The spar is the core structural element of the wing and is responsible for supporting the bulk of the weight of the aircraft in the air during level flight, plus any additional aerodynamic loads imposed during maneuvers. It's a critically important component of the aircraft. As such, the spar arrives from the factory having been carefully assembled and then dipped in an allodyne bath to help prevent any corrosion over the life of the aircraft. The first steps in the instructions are focused on preparing the spar for mating with all of the internal ribs and rear spar, which will complete the skeletal structure of the wing, as well as the outer skins and fuel tanks, which will complete the structure. So most of the individual components for the aircraft by themselves have a pretty minimal cost, which means if you kind of mess up on something and you just can't recover from it, worst case scenario, you just order a replacement part for $15 or $20 or so and move on, right? It's not the end of the world. The wing spars, however, are $4,500 each. And the first thing that Vans wants me to do in the instructions is start drilling holes and countersinking them. So, yeah, it's a case of measure 200 times and hopefully just cut once. And also hopefully in the right place. So here we go. In all seriousness, it's really important to read through the plans to be sure you fully understand how this all comes together. And to make sure that you pay attention to top, bottom, forward and aft. And whether you're working on the left spar or the right. So after a lot of review, I get started. The first step involves measuring and cutting some lengths of J-channel, which will eventually be used as stiffeners much later in the build to stiffen the wing skins. For each wing, I will be fabricating two short and two long sections of J-channel. Once complete, the instructions have me clamp the sections to the flanges of the spar. The edges are left sticking up 1 16th of an inch, and the ends flush with the ends of the spar. And then the short and long J-channel overlap in the middle of the spar. holes on the wing spar flange, where the skins will eventually attach, are actually being used in this step as a template to match drill holes in the J-channels. So I get to work match drilling holes and inserting Clecos as I go to keep everything lined up. Periodically I check to make sure I'm maintaining the 1 16th edge and make adjustments as necessary. There are three areas on the lower flange where nut plates for the fuel tanks will be, which therefore do not have the same number 40 holes for the skin. So on the lower J channels, no holes are match drilled in these areas. Once the upper J channels are drilled, they're marked and put aside for future use with the wing top skins. The lower J channels are then unclecoed, rotated 180 degrees, and then clecoed basically upside down to the upper flange, and then the undrilled areas can be match drilled. All right, so if I did this correctly, I took this J channel that was over here, I rolled it 180 degrees, which basically puts it upside down on this side, 
re coat it back into all the holes to match up with it lined up at both ends the way it's supposed to be. And then over here I had blue tape. Those were holes that we were not supposed to match drill in the J-channel when it was on the bottom. The instructions say to roll it over here to the top. And now I'm left with a section here, here, and there. And those all get match drilled now using the top edge as a guide. And I think I see why now. If you look here, this is the top edge where I'm going to match drill using the top as a guide. Where it was on the bottom, you had these groups of holes there. So they just wouldn't match up. I've read it five times. That's what it says to do. <laughs> so that's what I'll do and hopefully I didn't completely screw that up. I guess we'll see. Once complete, these are then set aside for future use with the bottom wing skins. Next, all of the other wing skin holes in the flanges are final drilled to number 40 size. The instructions call for doing the same thing to the nut plate attach rivet holes. However, I found that most of these holes were already pre-drilled to a number 40 size. And then, it was time to deburr all of the holes that I just drilled. The nut plate rivet attach holes next need to be countersunk just deep enough to let the AN426 flathead rivets sit flush with the flange of the spar, which of course is where the please don't let me screw up this $4,500 wing spar really starts to hit me. So after very carefully adjusting my countersink cutter with some scrap metal, I begin to countersink the holes. Once I had it set where I thought it was the correct depth, I actually backed it off a little bit so I could make the first cut and then slowly adjust it until I was happy with the final depth on the spar. As I went along countersinking, I periodically tested holes with a rivet to make sure everything was still good. There are also a few nut plate attach holes at the tip and the root of the spar, which are countersunk at this time as well. When you're countersinking these holes, make sure you properly understand which side the nut plates go on, so you make sure that you countersink on the correct side of the spar web. Finally, there are number 40 holes on the top flange and on the bottom, which are countersunk to the same depth at this time. The next step is to rivet the nut plates to the flanges with flush rivet heads. So when you're installing all these nut plates onto the wing spar, what they tell you to do is basically use um, a temporary screw into here through the wing spar to make sure that you've got it aligned perfectly before you set the rivets on either side of it. So I found a little screw that, that fit in there but it doesn't go all the way in as deep as I want it to to pull it tight against the wing spar. And I didn't want to run it through there and kind of damage the back end of that. So I had to build it up with a washer a little bit, but then the washer was kind of getting in the way of the, the pneumatic squeezer when I was trying to squeeze down on it. So what I did is I just took a grinding wheel and I just kind of ground down the edges a little bit on that. And basically that way it'll line up. You can still get your rivet squeezer in there nice and tight next to it. And then you can set all your rivets. But by doing that, um, it allows you to tighten the screw down to pull this completely flush against the edge of the wing spar there. And that way your rivets are gonna be nice and flush as they sit down in there and they'll come out nice.
At this point, while I had the number 40 countersink set up for these flush holes, I repeated everything I had just done with the left wing spar on the right wing spar. And now <laughs> came the really scary part. Using the nut plate screw holes as a guide to center up a number 30 countersink, it was time to make some pretty large countersinks in these holes so that both the dimpled tank skins and screws would sit flush on top of the spar flange. The instructions have a lot of detail for making these cuts with specific max limits on the inner and outer diameter of the countersink. To do this, I drilled and dimpled a scrap piece of aluminum, the same thickness as the wing tank and wing skins, to use as a guide as I made the first countersink. Here I started shallow and crept up on the final depth. In addition to test fitting the dimpled scrap piece, I also checked the inner and outer diameter of the hole as I went to make sure I wasn't exceeding any of the limits. In the end, I found a flush fit with the skin and tested it with a screw when I was at the inside diameter of about 5.2 millimeters and an outer diameter of 9.2. So I was within tolerance and felt that I had achieved a flush fit for everything. With everything set, I continued on to countersink all of the other screw holes. It removes a lot of material and makes quite a mess. Similarly, the number 40 countersink is used to do the same thing to screw holes in the nut plates for the wing access panel plate. Detailed instructions, including limits, are also outlined for this in the instructions. Next, all of the remaining number 40 holes in the flanges are countersunk just deep enough to allow the dimpled wing skins and their corresponding rivets to sit flush. And with that, all of the holes in the wing spar flanges have been countersunk. All of these countersunk areas then get spot primed to prevent any corrosion from attacking the spars where I have now removed all of that beautiful alodyne coating. While it isn't nearly as pretty anymore, it's very well protected. And let's be honest, no one is ever going to see these again once it's assembled. Next up, a couple of snap bushings are installed. At the root of each spar, the holes in the spar web and spar doubler are final sized and then riveted together. And then the fuel tank nut plates in the web are installed as well. Some of these were too far away from the edge to use a rivet squeezer, so instead they're bucked with a rivet gun. During this step, I found that the mushroom set for the rivet gun was a little bit too big to get in there properly and really get a flush fit with a rivet head. So I opted to use the bottom set here from my C-frame and then just put a flat set on that 
And that allowed me a little bit better access to really line it up and keep a nice flush fit against the rivet head while I was riveting. The last steps in this section involve final sizing some holes in the parts for the aileron bell crank brackets. These get deburred and prepped for installation. And with those parts primed, they're installed on the left and the right wing spar as appropriate. Because these need to be torqued down, I looked up the specs and found that it takes about 25 inch pounds to torque these in appropriately. I calculated about 10 inch pounds of drag just from rotating the bolt itself. So ended up about 30 to 35 inch pounds as I set these in place. And with that, the main wing spars are complete. From here, I move on to attaching the ribs to the spars. Well, there you go. Wing spars are done. Feels good to be making some progress on the uh, rest of the build, finally, after a long break. It all came out good. So don't think I screwed up uh, $9,000 worth of wing spar, so that's good. And uh, got plenty of stuff on the shelves over there to keep me busy. Moving on to the ribs for the uh, aft section of the wing. So that will be next. All right. Thanks for watching. Hope you found it useful. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.